So yes, you read that right. The economy's screwed and Bitcoin is the answer. And I'm going to tell you the story of why. That story begins in 2020 with the pandemic. In 2020, something that was already going to happen this decade got kick-started into high gear because we like to get ahead of things here in the United States. And it was the conclusion of the golden era of, glo of the global economy. The 2010s were the era, post-2008, pre-pandemic. It was the period of the greatest economic growth that you had ever seen in the history of mankind. We had finally brought online the entire Eastern European space. You'd brought online Asia. China was roaring. You were seeing supply chains and industrial bases being built out all over the, all over the Eastern all over the East Asian, Asian sphere. You had huge technological revolutions going on as a result of low credit, cro low credit costs and high demographical, um, uh, very profitable demographic bases. Massive millennial generation was young and in the workforce. A lot of them weren't even married, didn't have kids, so they're out there working 120 hours a week in Silicon Valley, driving the nation forward. And it was well and truly a golden era that is now over. And today I'm going to explain why that golden era is over, what it means for you as an American citizen or as a citizen of the world, and why Bitcoin is the answer. And the reason that this story begins in 2020 is because 2020 was the beginning of the end of that era. That era was already coming to an end for multiple reasons. A large portion of that reason has to do with demographics. The United States demography is very, very important to the United States' um, social experiment. And the reason that it's so important is because in the 2010s, you had the baby boomers, who are a massive generation, sitting between the age of about 50 and 65, and they were at the latter part of their career. They were making massive amounts of money. They didn't have mortgages anymore. Their uh, children had grown up and gone off to college, so they didn't have to pay for them anymore. So they had a huge amount of disposable income in a huge demographic base that they could invest in the stock market. And it had a lot to do with the reason that the stock market went through a massive rally. At the same time, you had the largest generation in the American history, the millennials, they were just coming into adulthood. And say what you will about the millennials, there's a lot of them, and they love tech. And so when you had the investment capital coming out of the boomers, going straight into the stock market, straight into tech stocks that the millennials were then using as venture capital to start new tech companies, you build a country that is on the bleeding cutting edge of technological innovation, and it, and it allowed us to continue to be the global superpower. It's not the only reason we remain the global superpower, but it allowed us to continue to dominate as the global superpower. The issue with that demography is that in 2020, that changed. Part of it is that a lot of those older people are either crippled to the point where they're not able to work or they just passed. The millennials are older now and they have a lot more debt burden. They have mortgages, they have cars, they have preschool payments, they have families and they don't have the ability to go out and work 80 or 120 hours a week and build Silicon Valley. They also don't have the kind of investment income because the older generation is, well, getting older and instead of being one of the biggest contributors to the tax base in the United States, now they're moving into retirement and they're becoming one of the biggest consumers of tax um, of tax dollars through social security programs and through other um, uh, benefits programs that the government offers. So the demography in the United States has shifted dramatically in the last um, 10 years to a demography that was extremely pro rapid growth and innovation to one that is a lot more starting to look like Japan. We're not quite there yet. We do not have an inverted pyramid, but it is coming. But that's not the only reason that the economy is in deep water. Part of the reason is because of the debt in the United States. You've had four presidents, George Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, now Biden, each trying to one-up each other with the amount of debt that they can spend. The House and the Senate both have absolutely no fiscal head on their shoulders whatsoever and believe that they can run a multi-trillion dollar a year deficit because the Fed can print money to buy treasuries at any point and essentially loan money to the government that didn't exist before the government borrowed it from the Fed. Remember, when the Fed does quantitative easing, one of the things that they buy are treasuries. What is a treasury? It is a loan that the government takes out that who buys? You, me, if we buy T-bills, but also the Fed with money that they can create just like that. That can't go on forever. When you have a debt system that is built on the back of such nonsense, the cost for that credit essentially, necessarily, has to go up over time. And so if you work in any area in the United States economy that has to do with debt, whether you have a credit card or a car loan or a personal loan or a business loan or you're a venture capitalist of some kind and you're trying to raise money for that through some kind of business loan, whether you have a mortgage, whatever it is, that debt is only going to get more expensive because the debt system that this country is built on is failing. Why else is the economy going into deep crap? Well, part of it is because the United States has started to realize that it does not any longer have a vested interest in patrolling the world's oceans. The United States is no longer going to be the global police. We've been trying to pull out of the Middle East for 15 years. We've been trying to pull out of um, 
um, South Africa, we've been, uh, South, uh, excuse me, South America and, uh, and Africa, we've been pulling resources out of the global seas and becoming a lot more akin to the United States in the 1910s and the 1920s than we were in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s and 2010s when we were guaranteeing national, uh, excuse me, international waters so that free trade could take place. The reason that that's a problem is because when the United States pulls out of the global police, you have things like Russia, Ukraine happen. You have things um, like the escalation that could come out of Israel and Hamas. And you end up seeing the globalization falls apart at the seams. And say what you will about globalization, there's a lot of things wrong with it. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things wrong with it. But this phone that I'm recording this on would not be possible without globalization, without international free trade. The computer that you might be watching this on would not be possible without international free trade. And that international free trade cannot happen if there are pirates that are driving insurance costs for shipping um, uh, for cargo ships up 50 times. Everything at the very best gets a lot more expensive when you don't have the United States patrolling the world oceans. And that will have impact back at home. And that's the direction the United States is going because they don't feel that they have a vested interest in patrolling the world's oceans anymore. The United States economy is screwed for a lot more reasons. I'd like to talk about it more in future videos. It's not over. We're still going to be the world's superpower, but it is going to get harder. Food is going to get more expensive. Credit is going to be more expensive. And generally, over the next decade, as we try and work out how do we run a modern economy without globalization, it is going to be a tumultuous period. And that tumultuous period will lead to people across the board being more skeptical in sovereign currencies. They're going to be less they're going to be more skeptical of the US dollar and every other currency in the world is downstream of the United States dollar. If the United States dollar is not performing, then that knocks on every single other I almost said altcoin, alternative national currency, alt currency because every single one of them is indexed based off of the United States dollar. If you look at any other country, uh, any other currency in the world, you decide what it's valued at based on its conversion rate to the dollar. So if the dollar is having difficulty because people no longer want to hold their value in it because the dollar is backed up by the good faith, good, the, uh, what, what is it that people say? The um, good faith of the, United, of the United States military and their ability to, de to deliver on the promises relating to treasuries and T-bills, if people start to have a wavering um, confidence in that, then that leads people to not want to hold the dollar. And where do they go when they don't hold the dollar? Historically, where do people go when they don't want to hold the dollar? They go to gold. But Bitcoin is the new gold. Bitcoin has unchanging principles, unlike gold. Gold can change. It's physical nature, no. But the economy around it, its supply, its demand, the increase in its supply, the increase or decrease in its supply, the mining, the usage, all of those things are in flux. It is not a, a permanent fundamental in the same way that Bitcoin is. It also has to be shipped, put on a plane and shipped across the world if you want to move it. You have to create artificial um, economic models to move it like ETFs and you have to create exchange traded products just to trade the thing. If you want to actually move the, bit, the gold, you got to put it on a plane and move it. Talk about a risk for hijacking, especially when the United States is no longer playing world security. Gold is the predecessor to Bitcoin. So when people are fleeing the dollar, because they're losing confidence in the United States government, where are they going to go? Are they going to go to gold? Yes, they will. And gold will be successful through this. And gold will be a half-decent investment. But they're also going to go to Bitcoin because Bitcoin does exactly what gold does, only better. And Peter Schiff is going to regret his stance against Bitcoin in the long run because when these economic realities that are essentially unavoidable at this point in time. The reality of the demographic situation in the United States, the reality of the geopolitical and global situation, increasing oil prices, increasing unrest and um, instability in the Middle East, these realities that could boil over into regional or even global conflicts at any point mean that companies start to get a lot more scared and they start to do a lot more things back home because they believe that's a lot safer, and it is safer. And that drives costs up a lot. And when costs go up, and when you have a massive amount of inflation, and the United States has to raise interest rates because of that, it only makes the problem worse. It's like trying to get out of a Chinese finger trap by pulling as hard as you can. And that's what the Fed is gonna find itself doing this decade if it's not careful. Increasing interest rates, making the debt situation worse because it's trying to solve a problem that it, does, that it doesn't have the solution to anyway, because the Fed and the United States government have no control over the demographics, and the Fed has no control over whether or not we allow globalization to continue at all. That's out of Jerome Powell's wheelhouse. And so when those things impact the public's confidence in the dollar, 
Where shall they go? They shall come here. And I've known that since I was 16 years old. I'm 23 now. I've been in the cryptocurrency market for over six years now. I remember when I was 17 years old, people asked me, yeah, why are you in Bitcoin? You know, you wanted to be into astrophysics. You wanted to go into astrophysics. You were going to work at NASA. Why are you going to go do this Bitcoin stuff? What is this? You're throwing your future away, man. I told people one day this is going to be the future. One day this is going to solve a problem. It already is. You know, this is 2017. I'm saying this to some of my friends in, in, in um, my senior year of high school. One day Bitcoin is going to be one of the chief ways that the world solves some very serious problems of preserving capital in an unstable world. And I want to be there to guide them to understand how to take part in this 21st century economic experiment that is Bitcoin so that they can achieve, I didn't know this word then, but what I was trying to convey was financial sovereignty having control over our own finances and over our own financial systems and institutions rather than them having control over us. Because I believe that you, surrendered to God, are the best steward of your finances of anyone in this world. And it is for that reason that I own Bitcoin. It is for that reason that I will always own Bitcoin. And it is for that reason that I believe that the United States economy is not done but a little bit up a creek without a paddle and maybe even without a kayak. And Bitcoin is the answer. If you enjoyed today's video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.